Hello, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this awesome webinar. Shout out to the Pre-Sales Collective and, of course, the team at Reprise that I am part of. So I'm uh, super excited about that. We're going to be focused today on product demo best and worst uh, practices. And so we've all been there. Uh, we're going to give folks a little time to just log in. So for the audience members out there, if you don't mind, go ahead and click on the Q&A button right here below. Submit your questions and we'll, we'll go ahead and get to those uh, at the appropriate time here uh, during the session. How's everyone doing today? Doing pretty good. I know we have folks from all over the place, so that's uh, that's great. And oh yeah, and, and for the audience members, go ahead and comment. Let us know where you're tuning in from. It's always nice to see where uh, where folks are uh, tuning in from these days. And of course, we're going to go ahead and uh, show the slide. I love this slide. Uh, also, shout out to Will Smith, who's our designer. I just really love uh, the way that Will uh, designs are. Our slides. Uh, we have Austin, Texas, Fort Lauderdale. All right, Raleigh, North Carolina, Denver, Chicago, London, and we have almost 400 people who signed up to this webinar. So uh, um, it's pretty awesome. And then we always get folks coming in, uh, you know, sort of at the end here. India, right on, right on. And again, folks, uh, I see there's a couple questions being submitted here in the Q&A. So that's, uh, that's absolutely awesome. Don't forget to, to click on that Q&A. And uh, oops, actually, these are locations. Okay, awesome. Well, you know, we'll, we'll transfer those over here. We have Amsterdam, oh, or Netherlands, I should say. Awesome. New York. Awesome. Right on. You know, it's interesting. I, I, I host a podcast called Demo Diaries. So we're constantly hearing, you know, sort of the, the different stories, best practices, the things that go wrong uh, in, in demos, because we've all been there. And we also see some of sort of the uh, the new ways of doing demos, right? So I'm really excited to dig in there and uh, and you know, really be able to share what the, the greatest, uh, you know, sort of uh, practitioners out there, which we are joined by four of them here today, have to say about the topic. So thank you so, so much. All right, we'll give it another, uh, another minute and, uh, and then we'll go ahead and kick it off. And by the way, uh, Alex, if you can go ahead and post the poll and you folks, you'll see a poll pop up on your screen. Just take a quick second to fill that out while we uh, wait to, to actually kick off the rest of the webinar. Thank you so much. I see we have a question that, uh, that came in from London. Fantastic. I love the international folks. You know, I remember when I was in college, I was dying to go and, and backpack around and I went ahead and did it and it was probably the best time, uh, one of the best times of my life. So uh, anytime I see like a, a European name and one of these uh, or location on one of these webinars, I get super excited. All right. Well, I think we'll go ahead and uh, and kick it off if if everyone is uh, is ready to rock and roll. Um, hello, everyone. My name is George Soto or Jorge or Jorge. I, I get them both. I was named after George Harrison of the Beatles, and my parents uh, did not actually name me George, so I blame it on them. But uh, they did refer to me as George, so here here I am. Uh, I'm excited, as I mentioned, to be joined by four amazing pre-sales panelists today. Some of the best brightest and greatest in the space. Why don't we kick it off with Melissa, if you can just tell folks a little bit about your you know, career background and you know, how you got into solutions consulting at, at, uh, in a moment. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm Melissa Garulli. I uh, am based out of California. I'm actually most recently from Chicago. The last 12 years I spent in Chicago. So hi to all my Chicago friends. Uh, my husband and I just moved to California. He's in the wine industry. So awesome. I am riding those coattails and enjoying <laughs> the perks of being in the industry. But uh, a little bit about me, I am actually an SC boomerang. So I started my career as an SC at Oracle. Um, so hi to my fellow Oracle friends. 
Uh, and then I did, uh, I did a couple years there. I moved over to Sprinkler where I was in the success side of the house for the last almost three years. And then now came back to the SC side uh, at InMoment. So my tenure has been within the customer experience for the last like seven plus years. Uh, X Oracle, hello, hello. <laughs> um, so I, I love being back on this side of the house. I'm really excited uh, to kind of have my perspective to having the SC and success blend. So hopefully that gets peppered in through my experience, but i um, delighted to be here. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Melissa. Stephanie, how are you? Thanks for being here. Hi, good to see everyone. And thank you so much, George, for hosting this. Um, I'm Stephanie Lee. I work as a solutions consultant at Gainsight, um, but got here from a kind of roundabout way. I started my career actually teaching um, special ed math and science um, out in Los Angeles and um, got laid off because they didn't have the budget to, to keep special ed teachers. So I actually went and worked for a hardware company for a while doing environmental auditing and then found my way into healthcare and health IT. And that's where I got my start solutions consulting. I spent time as a trainer and as a support uh, rep and then actually got brought into solutions consulting because I could do kind of all the things and was a subject matter expert. Um, and I'm really happy in this space. I'm really happy that I found the pre-sales collective and really happy to be solutions consulting. So really excited for the panel today. Awesome. Thank you so much. Leon, how are you from Salesforce? Everyone's favorite CRM. Of course, it feels like it's the only CRM to be honest with you, right? Thanks so much. That, George. I think we're at probably 19 or 20% of the market, oddly enough. So it's a very fun, very crowded space. We're happy to be a part of. Uh, good to meet everyone. Uh, my name is Leon. Uh, I'm senior manager of solutions engineering at Salesforce. I manage our small and growth business teams for Boston and New England and the Mid-Atlantic out of DC. Um, I would say I have a non-traditional path to solutions engineering, but I don't think anyone has a traditional path. I have one person on my team who minored in sales engineering in college, and that's the first time I've ever seen someone get a degree in anything close to being an SE. Uh, my path took me to law first, uh, and I spent a lot of time in intellectual property law as a paralegal and exec assistant mm -hmm. straight out of college, um, and very quickly realized that our clients over in Cambridge and Somerville working at startups were having a lot more fun uh, being just about as successful as the partners and managing partners at my firm. So to make a very long story very short, uh, I did my best to get into tech via uh, software engineering and ended up here. Uh, more than happy to get into the details later on with anyone who wants to dive in, but great to be here today, George. Awesome. Thank you so much. And Frank, why don't you uh, take us home here? And by the way, I think you you folks own IT Glue as well. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. We had uh, one of your colleagues on uh, on the podcast recently. That's right. Supriya was one of my most recent hires. So yeah. uh, thank you for having me on and uh, yeah. glad to be here. So Frank Tisolano, I'm the Senior Director of uh, Global Pre-Sales and Technical Account Manager Managers for uh, Kaseya. We are about a 19 year old, uh, I'll say startup. Uh, we have about uh, 35,000 customers all around the world. Uh, our uh, 40 plus SE support about 30 products. So a little bit about myself. Uh, let's see, uh, uh, I am now in about three more days, I will have finished my 32nd year of presets. 32nd wow. year. So I was going to ask the question, how many people have work longer than that in pre-sales? Or maybe should I say, how many people were born after I started in pre-sales? I don't know which one would be more embarrassing. So <laughs> I started out, I think the traditional manner back then in the eighties, we, we, most of us came out of development and just migrated to the products that we were supporting. So the sales guy for the product that I ultimately uh, went to go work for software AG um, introduced himself, said, Hey, listen, the guy that was supporting you left you seem like a pretty good guy. You want to come and do yes. this pre-sales thing? And I was like, I have no idea what it is, but it sounds uh, pretty exciting. So, um, so yeah, that was my path 32 years ago on July 15th. <laughs> well, congratulations, Frank, because you really laid the foundation for all of us. And I was about eight years old when, <laughs> when you started your career. Okay. So. Uh, so that's awesome. Awesome. Well, uh, let's let's go ahead and kick it off if we can go to the next slide here. So just to set the stage a little bit, 
we all know that demos are really a critical part of our sales motions, but it's not this one size fits all experience like before, right? So like knowing your product in and out by itself is really not gonna, gonna cut it. And what re really, I think what makes it worse is that nowadays the definition of I shouldn't say worse, but more challenging, which is always fun. The definition of a product demo is really shifting, right? So you have you know, a, some folks who want to see a specific demo on the first call and, and then have a different experience the second call. You might have one stakeholder who maybe doesn't want the whole kitchen sink. And really, if you, if you do give them, you will lose them. So having to create these experiences are really, really important. And I think that being able to be more flexible, we've all been trained a specific way to follow whatever sales framework that you've been uh, you know, trained uh, around in the past. You know, those things are still, from what I hear in the market, still valuable, but it, it's more important to be agile today than ever before. So we're really gonna dig into these things. And again, for the audience out there, I see a couple of questions being submitted fantastic as we go through this don't forget to click on the q a because that's going to be super valuable and if we do not get to it during today's webinar that's okay we'll we'll get to it in a blog post or in a conversation in slack definitely sign up to the pre-sales collective community so why don't we go ahead and kick it off here with stephanie and you know we'll just kind of go around the horn here just kind of speak to what do you do what does your team do and maybe you can dive in a little deeper around the particular functions of your team when you get involved in opportunities those sorts of things what does that look like sure Thanks, George. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as I mentioned before, I work for Gainsight. Um, specifically, I support our Enterprise East team and our healthcare uh, practice. So we have a healthcare vertical at Gainsight, just started um, last year, and we are very experimental, um, looking to expand um, Gainsight's reach in the customer success space, but specifically for healthcare um, companies and in the healthcare industry. So what I do at Gainsight and what my team does is we work very closely to understand um, any prospects that we have in our pipeline, what are they looking to solve for? What is it that is that compelling event that, that, that has brought them to Gainsight looking for a customer success or for a product analytics tool um, and trying to align very closely um, to what their needs are and what their goals are. Um, yeah. Now, Stephanie, are there any particularly like in the sales, uh, Salesforce, I'm just assuming you use Salesforce, but in the CRM, maybe just say CRM, uh, are there any stages or like fields or triggers that sort of indicate, okay, this is the time that we're going we're to come in and intervene in, in the deal? Yeah, that's a great question. So we've actually done a lot in the last couple months to kind of rethink how we think about the demo and when we actually find it appropriate to bring a solutions consultant in for a demo. So we have what we call the buyer line sales process, which we've reimagined very recently. And we've built a lot of tools around that. And a lot of that is around Salesforce, collecting data in Salesforce in the opportunity and having different stages at which it's appropriate to actually have that product demo. So having enough information on those pains, on the value points and everything. Yeah, I'm hearing a lot around this solutions qualified opportunity or, or even lead. So, uh, so awesome. Leon, why don't you uh, take us, take us uh, into kind of, you know, what is, what's your role and your team's focus over at Salesforce? Yeah, no, great question. And I'll, I'll kind of skip over the stuff I assume is probably similar. I think what makes us pretty uh, maybe unique, um, although maybe very similar to a lot of startups, which I hope is the case. Um, our SEs are, are very ingrained with our sales team. We have a one-to-one -one SE to sales team model. And so what we try to preach is definitely um, being a, a resource for your team beyond just the demos. Um, so we'll certainly get involved after like a certain level of qualification, but depending on the circumstance, the AE involved, the type of deal, whether it's competitive, I think what I really pride my team on, and I think you could say about the teams across the country, of which there are a few members here today, um, is that we very much lean in and partner with sales such that 
um, we try to provide solutions and expertise that go sort of beyond the traditional disco and demo cycle, mm -hmm. um, beginning with as early as helping qualify or helping to uncover um, different pipeline in sort of larger strategic consultative engagements, um, as well as helping with the final packaging. We have quite a few products here at Salesforce. So yep. SEs are leaned on, I'd say a little bit before and a little bit after the traditional cycle, which is something we try to lean into. And how are you interfacing with the demo engineering team? I know that Salesforce yeah. is very well known for that. There are a couple of organizations now starting to build that out, but you know, you're really sort yeah. of the model. Very timely question. I think a few people were on uh, an enablement right before this meeting for what we call our Q branch after the uh, James Bond gadget factory. Um, and they do everything from sort of uh, design help and expertise on, on decks and collateral and even videos. Um, our demo engineering team, are they're incredible to work with. They help us build out those customizations. Anything that requires um, a, a level of customization or just we need the bandwidth. Small and growth businesses move very quickly. So sometimes we'll need that extra support to help build out a demo and they'll help out with that. I think the number one way they touch our org though is through our demo org that we have. We have an instance um, or many instances that you can request um, that allow you to uh, basically have all of our products in one place and certainly requires quite a bit of configuration to get up and running. Um, I hope none of my salespeople are on this call. Uh, it requires a lot of work to get a demo off the ground. It cannot be turned around in 24 hours. Um, but uh, yeah, that's probably the number one way because that, that requires a lot of maintenance. You can imagine with um, that much product in, in one instance, they do a tremendous amount of great work giving us the tools to succeed even when they're not directly engaged. Awesome. I have so many questions just because I signed up for a, well, the lowest tier for my cousin's uh, law firm, I don't know, two months ago. And then yeah. we ended up um, upgrading to pro and then we, we needed uh, to do some switching. So it was so interesting because the, the, it was so high touch and I was like, we're not paying that much. How could you do this? So it's really cool to see that Salesforce is still supporting, you know, all tiers. Uh, so awesome. Frank, mm -hmm. why don't you, uh, you know, give us a little little background on, around your world. Sure, sure. So I, th I think we have a fairly unique model. First of all, um, all of our lead, 99% of our leads are inbound. Uh, our sales cycles are incredibly short. So my, my organization focuses on SMB and managed service providers. Uh, sales cycles are measured in days and maybe weeks. Um, so um, the process is very simple. Uh, the rep does a discovery, SE gets that information, delivers a demo uh, with probably about half of our products. They will um, engage a customer in, uh, we call it a evaluation jumpstart. So most of our products are very, relatively straightforward. So we give them like an hour uh, to front end their trial, their evaluation, and then they are off on their own. And, uh, occasionally we'll do, you know, multi-hour evaluation assistance, but for the most part, that's it. Most, most times sales are closed with two, if not sometimes one hour of SE engagement. Awesome, awesome. And Melissa, how are, how are you? And uh, what's your role in, in your team's focus? Sure, so I am doing great, thank you. Uh, so my team, very similar to what's been covered here. Uh, I want a plus one and exclamation point, uh, Leon's comment on demos do not take less than 24 hours to prep. There is a lot of work that goes behind the scenes. Uh, something unique about the InMoment team, uh, we are growing. So uh, we don't have a one-to-one -one alignment. Uh, we're regionally aligned right now, growing, evolving, but it's really affords our SCs a lot of opportunity to work across different uh, verticals with different reps. Um, but the key to our SC methodology, um, we actually, it's embroidered on a, my SC jacket here, uh, preparation, integrity, and empathy are our core values as a team. So as we're approaching the selling process, as we're working with either the discovery and joining our, our sales directors early on in the process, or maybe we're joining a little bit later, we really try to root all of our efforts around those three core values. So that way we show up um, most prepared. And I think empathy is the biggest one, uh, especially in the last year, you know, realizing that human element of all of us uh, as our clients, the buyers, as the team supporting 
um, really just bringing our authentic selves to the demo is something unique about in moment. I love that. Thank you, Melissa, because, mm-hmm. you know, I'm a touchy feely type of person. <laughs> so I, I love that stuff. Just real quick. Um, uh, Leon, we had a couple questions around the one on one to one ratio. So, you know, just because there were like eight of them that just exploded <laughs> here real quick. Uh, just to confirm, you have a one SE to one sales rep uh, ratio, or do you sales have a sales team? I would love team. a one to one sales rep okay. ratio. If I can get passage for about six or seven X the headcount, I would definitely hire it out, but I don't think it makes smart business sense. So it's one team to one AE. And I know that the topic of today is more around demos, but um, would love to talk uh, more about that model. I think it's something I'm passionate about uh, having one aligned SE to one sales team in particular. Obviously, you know, that's what we shoot for and people go on vacation and take PTO and there's headcount and things like that. But um, yeah, I think that's a, a big part of success in building a relationship with your sales team and getting to know each other over the course of time. So maybe we'll put a pin in that for another day, but definitely one SE to one sales team, um, much as I'd like it otherwise. Absolutely. Well, maybe we can dive into these questions and dig a little deeper because it's all obviously correlated uh, in the Q&A section. Actually, Leon, why don't you, uh, you know, maybe speak to a a little bit about the roles that uh, other team members play during the demo, right? So like, uh, you know, maybe particularly on your team, like, you know, what does that particularly look like? And, uh, and then maybe before the demo as well. Yeah, great call. And I know we talked a little bit about the Q branch team. We also have a lot of specialists that we pull in for particular products. Um, and so rather than kind of go into to that, which we already talked about, we definitely lean on those experts occasionally to demo, um, as well as to help build out demos and solve problems and solution. I think that the heart of your question is kind of what happens during the demo as well as the prep for it. We definitely have a lot of people internally um, that help prep. I think during the, the demonstration, oh, it's, it's a- as tough as it can be for an SE to focus on um, the demo and also keep a sort of side chat going. I do think that level of collaboration, especially on discoveries, and if you can pull it off on demos as well, makes for a really, really successful demo. So a lot of times we'll be relying on um, our salespeople to hop in with ties to value. Obviously everyone, every SE knows, like you wanna tie to value as much as possible, but it's really, really nice if you have another voice in the room and another person hopping in with the, direct ties to like quantifiable business value and sort of driving home what will eventually be a business justification for the purchase so that you as an SE can focus on the tech and and getting the technical win and, um, you know, being that trusted advisor for for the client. So um, there's definitely a lot of roles, especially in our bigger strategic deals to dive into, um, Q branch among them. But I think that's really the key relationship and the key partnership outside of the, the SE on any given deal is maintaining that nice balance with your sales counterparts. And how do you sort of gauge customer acquisition costs, right? Where and and say, okay, well, if the deal looks like this and it's this big, or it has these variables or parameters, then we'll bring in Q branch or we'll bring in two more people to help. Like that's always difficult, right? Yeah. Good question. I I think we, we're, with the exception of you know super involved engagements that, that require other teams to run super strategic engagements, we're pretty good about not worrying about that cost of sale. I think uh, as a SaaS business, as I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with, like the eventual payoff for that cost of sale is over the course of many years and, and potentially exponential on top of it. So I think apart from the very, very low end of the market, which it sounds like even you yourself and, and uh, your cousin were, were able to experience a pretty high touch relationship. And then the very, very top end of the market where we're running multiple day or week kind of consultative engagements, we really don't worry too much about the, the cost of sale. Obviously you wanna manage your time correctly and manage it in the right places on an individual SE basis. But when it comes to pulling in extra resources, um, we do really focus on kind of what's best for the customer at a given time. Um, obviously prioritizing time accordingly, but, but other than that, um, there's no real limited resource when it comes to the dollars and cents. Gotcha. Gotcha. Stephanie, what was kind of your world there around, you know, how, how your team is involved in these demos and kind of what that looks like? 
Sure, yeah. So we actually at Gainsight have something similar to what Leon described as the Q branch. So we have a sales engineering team in India that can help with customizing individual demo orgs when we need it. Um, there is a bit of a, an evaluation that we do and there's nothing formalized in place, but it's usually, you know, how much time do I have? Can I do this myself? Or do I need to kind of shop it out to someone else to take care of so that I can focus on something else that's on my plate? Um, we also have a value consulting team at Gainsight that helps us run like ROI analysis so that if we do have customers who need to understand, you know, what is the ROI for this tool and what would that look like, that value consulting team helps us to provide that readout and make that presentation. Gotcha. Melissa, you know, from, from your perspective, what's the biggest product demo mistake that mm. you see in the, in the field? And I think, you know, I just think about my recent, well, this was like a couple months ago where I was carrying a bag and I totally botched this demo. And it was primarily because I didn't align with my other with the colleague, the other stakeholder that was in the meeting, because we were, you know, our excuse that was that we were too busy, but that alignment is super important. Yeah. So what I'm hearing there is preparation. And that's one of our core values uh, for, for your experience. For what comes to mind for demo crimes and what I jotted down kind of thinking ahead was uh, not engaging the audience enough, right? So a lot of times we show up and we just start talking. And as much as I love to talk, I really cringe when I'm at a demo and we're not engaging the rep. And you know, I'm not saying, hey, Frank, is this resonating? How do you see yourself leveraging this tool? Or Stephanie, do you think your team would find value in this? Um, you know, you especially being in a remote world now with Zoom, sometimes people are not on camera and you can't see, are they on their phone? Are they getting, you know, disengaged? And so for us, one thing that we really try to do is engage the team, make it a very collaborative conversation versus I'm just going to stand here and tell you everything and room for Q&A at the end. Um, but there's an art too of like crafting the right open-ended questions because you can do a lot of like yes, no questions, but then that's it, right? We want to get our customers talking because that's how you're discovering even more. So uh, for, that's the biggest demo crime in, that I'm, I don't know, tracking, I guess. <laughs> awesome. Well, Frank, you've been doing this for a long time. I was eight years old learning how to maybe ride a bike. Uh, actually, I was probably running into mailbox. I remember that day trying to win my training wheels. Anyways, uh, what, what's your take? What have you seen over, over your years? And, and then how do you know, you know, to, to Melissa's point, like, how do you know, hey, these are the, the right number of open-ended questions? I'll, I'll piggyback off of what Melissa said. I, I think uh, in the world of Zoom, which we live in it almost 100% of the time, you know, uh, we have uh, low um, average cost of, uh, average cost or average sales price, uh, uh, products. So everything is transacted over the phone. So it is ultra critical to ensure that we are staying engaged. And I don't think, uh, you know, other than distracting um, the customer from the demo and from your own flow, I think there's no limit to how many questions uh, you should ask. I, th I think what's important uh, uh, is something that I learned in Sandler, Sandler selling, which uh, is a technique called reversing where um, if a customer asks you a question, um, you do three things. You acknowledge the question. So thank you for that question. I get that a lot. Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Uh, rephrase the question to make sure that the customer asked you what they really wanted to ask you. And then instead of answering the question, ask another question. Hey, why is that important to you? Is it a question that was um, laid by the competitor, you know? So why is that important to you? Uh, how does that help you? You know, uh, and if they answer the question, continue to drill down and almost like peel back the onion and, and try to get deeper and deeper. And that's how you keep them engaged. And, and uh, I always used to say, uh, I'd bore myself with some of my demos. So I needed the customers to keep me engaged myself. So I need to ask a lot of questions. Awesome, awesome. Thank you for that. You know, Stephanie, I 
have been an SDR. That's I started my career in SaaS as an SDR. And I remember I, I would always made the mistake of showing the entire kitchen sink, right? What would you say from, you know, and you know, I'd have this 40, oh no, 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 45 minutes, I promise. And then it's, you know, 44 minutes of the demo. And at the end, I'm like, oh, so you know, what do you think? What do you, you know, and obviously I, lo- I lost them about 30 minutes before. Uh, from your perspective, what would you say are the, the biggest no-nos or mistakes that you've seen in the field? Yeah, I mean, I think the Harbor Cruise demo, everyone's kind of alluded to it. I think that's a very common um, pain point for our audiences. Um, You don't want to show up to a demo and just show everything. That just, I think, reveals that you don't know enough about them. So you're just trying to throw things up the wall and see what sticks. Um, So really understanding going in, you know, do you have strong discovery? Do you understand what the customer is looking to do? and target things specifically to that. Sometimes I'll even start with what I know are the most important things and do those things first and just gauge the audience reaction. Even ask them just up front, like, how does this resonate with you? How do you see this impacting your day-to-day if you were to switch to this instead of what you're doing today? And how many clicks, I love the Harbor Tour. We talk a lot about the Harbor Tour and there are a couple authors out there which I'm blanking out on right now. Uh, uh, Mr. Cohen, anyways, um, that wrote that book. Okay. Anyways, he's going to kill me if he sees this. In in any case, uh, how do you know how long that Harbor tour should be? That's a good question. Um, Well, I think that if you, that's a really good question. I think if you think about only having half of that allotted time, to actually show them anything because you might have the CEO on the call and they have to leave after the first 15 minutes um, or you're gonna lose people's attention after the first 10. So think about what are the most important things to get in in those really short windows right at the beginning when everyone is really excited and, and engaged, get that stuff done first. And then from there, it kind of flows uh, organically where they'll start asking questions. If you're doing what you need to do, they should be engaged and asking questions and it'll just kind of come naturally on its own. And if I may, Jorge, a couple of points there. Um, So number one, always leave the rep like 10 minutes till the end of the demo. I don't know if anyone mentioned that. I apologize if they did. You know, we need to talk about next steps, but the rep or the SE, because I think demos should be done collaboratively. Uh, need to ask the question, uh, two questions. On a scale of one to 10, how well did we do? If they say a 10, hey, great. So did we meet all the requirements? Yeah. If they say a five, ooh, what did we miss? What didn't maybe we show you to uh, Stephanie's point? You want to hit all the items? You want to touch upon maybe the, the things that are important to you that different maybe differentiate you from other products? but also to make sure that you've covered everything that they wanted to see. So asking that question, hey, is there anything that I missed that I could show you either now with the last few minutes or maybe schedule a second time? I love that, Frank. It's like when I interview, I always ask at the end, so based on our conversation today, do I sound like I'm you know, a good good candidate for the- <laughs> Right, for the exactly, close. And then, yeah. yeah, the closing question, right? Awesome. Uh, Leon, you know, from your perspective, you know, what are some of the, the biggest uh, mistakes or hiccups uh, that you've seen in the field? And, and you know, I, I know that a lot of people just go into, as Melissa you know, alluded to, we just sort of go in without any framework a lot of the time. And so, of course, that could certainly hurt you. Yeah, definitely. I think that um, the Harbor Cruise has a time and a place. And I think... Um, it's certainly something we, we, we utilize in certain situations. I think what worries me about it is when you've got maybe a couple of Harbor Cruises and you craft a demo that's sort of a Frankenstein of three or four different demos that you know, or different product demos. And as much as you know, our, our job could be boiled down to Frankensteining various tools in our toolbox to, to create a, a something bespoke for a client, um, I think what, what I try to do, and anyone on my team is definitely going to laugh when I say this out loud if they're watching, is I really encourage my SEs to write a script to their discovery and then demo to that script and, and build their demo out to that script. And I think what that helps is, I think to, to Stephanie's point, I think it was uh, you 
you want to make sure you're really listening to the, the client, what they have to say. So when you write a script based on a discovery without thinking to the extent that you can about the product or what you're going to show or what the demo is going to look like, just write the story of their life or their, their work and, and do so. And, you know, their future, right. Beautiful future on, on your product, kind of what their life is going to be like in an ideal world. Um, not only are you making their, what they said on the disco front and center, it's also easier to do right after a disco. So it's kind of nice to get that down without having to think about crafting a demo while it's all still fresh. And then when you come back to build that demo, you're not building extraneous stuff. You're not showing anything extraneous. You're building a demo specifically to that script. It cuts down on your demo time and also makes sure it's, it's super focused. So that's definitely a phrase of script to your disco and, and demo to your script that, um, I've probably said ad nauseum to every single one of my SEs, but I, I do think it is super important and just like a nice way to think about that to avoid some of those pitfalls. And, and I'm sorry, and I hate to keep adding my two cents in here, but uh, I, You're I agree OG, with you. the OG, Frank. You get, you get the, oh, your, your, your time Oh, here. thank you. Um, I agree with you, uh, Leon. However, um, depending on the level of requirements, there might be... 15 different CRMs in your case, Leon, that will meet 100% of the requirements. So one thing that I was taught a long, long time ago is uh, number one, make sure you you explain and sell them what they need and not what not not only what they are asking for, but what they need. Okay. And number two, I think I kind of alluded to this before. Uh, make sure you're differentiating yourself from your competitor. You know, uh, I could if I'm a a small business and I need some basic contact management, you know, am I going to buy Salesforce or buy, I don't know, whatever the low end product is these days, you want to sell them Salesforce if they're, you know, 10 users, right. Or whatever it is. So you really need to make sure, Hey, this is what you're going to grow into. Why, why not just make the leap now, as opposed to buying something for today's needs and then having to migrate over to Salesforce five years from now. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's a great point. I think all the more reason to tie to that, that what you're hearing from them and, and paint that vision based off what you're hearing instead of what you think it might be. But yeah, point definitely taken, Frank. And Leon, to, uh, to my point earlier, the 80% of the market, we don't even know what they're called. So, um, but quick question, Leon, how, how, like, what's the ratio between disco and discovery and, uh, and uh, demo, uh, you know, when, when you're writing out that script? Yeah, uh, in terms of like time spent on exactly recovery, um, it should always be at least one to one, I think. But um, like, there should be at least as much disco as there is disco, uh, as there is demos. And and we are talking a little bit about an ideal world. We all run into those use cases where it's like they want it yesterday. We need to run super fast. It's the end of the quarter. Like there are definitely situations. Uh, I I don't think we'd ever do like a disco slash demo. There are certainly other ways to solution in those use cases. But if you're running a, a traditional cycle or anything remotely strategic, I think you're shooting for at minimum, if it's going to be an hour demo, an hour of discovery. And it depends, applies to all of this. But if anything, uh, if you're really trying to drive it home and it's a relatively decent sized deal, um, you may want your traditional discovery and then get input from sort of the end users, boots in the ground kind of feel and what their day to day is like, and then maybe a touch point with power if they're not on that original discovery. So um, end up having maybe two or three um, per call just to make sure everyone's aligned and you're part of our job is, you know, to bring different parts of a business together and, and rowing in the same direction. So um, at least minimum one-to-one, -one, probably shooting for two or three times as much discovery at the end of the day. Awesome. Now, Melissa, when you think about sort of extracting those specific features that you know your you know audience or buyers are, are going to need to achieve whatever it is, the outcome that they're looking to achieve, how do you actually go about that, you know, discovering that uh, those features and, and rolling out that process? Yeah. So ideally, this is where it's a team effort, right? So when you're in the discovery process, you, I try to have a, not only the sales director, but maybe if a practitioner is going to be a part of this uh, presentation and practitioner for us, we have folks that lived and breathed in the customer feedback role um, that have now come over and consult for us. And so can really align to, I've been in your shoes. This is how I've done it or how I've grown my business uh, in the past. I love involving them early 
So we can collaborate coming out of that uh, discovery, like Leon was saying, you know, to be able to then script and really start to paint that picture. The other piece that I try to do is, you know, if I'm questioning, am I hitting the nail on the head? Am I, am I really demoing to those right features, especially trying to be pithy and succinct and really nailing it? I will try to build a champion within our, our prospect and see if they'll dry run with us. Um, I've had the privilege of being able to do that with a couple of demos. Not always everybody's re receptive to that and could be RFP process and all of that. But if you can build a champion and validate with them, you know, here's one, at least the outline, here's what I'm trying to plan, what I'm going to be delivering. Is this, on, you know, on par with your expectations? I mean, that's just gonna help you build that relationship, that trusted advisor, but it's also gonna help you win the demo too. So um, those are kind of some things we think about. Stephanie, how about your, your experience with that? Like really being able to extract those specific features? Yeah, I love Melissa's uh, point about building that champion. We do that as well. Um, sometimes we'll do a split where the AE will kind of deal with all the salesy stuff, but then the SC will run that conversation with the champion and really make sure, are we hitting all of that? Act as that trusted IT advisor. Um, I've had prospects actually do reverse demos for me where they'll show me what is the thing that we're trying to replace. And then that allows me to turn it around and customize a demo to speak to those very specific workflows. Um, that's been really successful as well. And Frank, uh, what's been your experience? Um, I mean, very much the same. Uh, here again, uh, the sales process is relatively simple. So we, we don't need to take advantage of some of the things that Stephanie and Melissa have said, you know, building a champion, you know, sometimes the, the technician on, on the call or in the evaluation becomes our champion and we got to get him to buy in on the, the business and the, the technical value. But uh, you know, for the most part, you know, similar to what uh, Melissa and Stephanie said, uh, but I just want to throw out one thing. Uh, um, I've, I've always had these co couple of sayings. Um, when, uh, when I first started, one of the junior, oh, maybe a couple of jobs after I started, one of the junior SEs said, hey, you know, what, what makes you successful? And it's like, it's not me. It's the rep who puts me in a position to be successful. So I used to tell them everything that happens before the demo is more important than the demo itself. And I think, you know, we've been harping on the, on the uh, concept of discovery. And I mean, if you don't nail the discovery beforehand, no matter what you do in the demo, you know, unless you're lucky, you know, could end up being a miss. So if there's anything, you know, any of us need to walk away from you is do make sure you have a thorough discovery before you start that demo. That is the key to success. You know, we talk a lot about hacking things in the technology world, particularly startups, growth hacking, sales hacking, whatever, right? You know, Leon, from your perspective, any sort of like non-traditional approaches that you've seen uh, your reps or maybe you've used yourself that have been surprisingly effective? Yeah, great question. Um, probably have a few examples of like uh, silly costumes uh, that people have worn and, and things like that. Um, definitely anything to break the ice in that regard, I think helps a lot. Um, and, and, and I try to, to push my team, I think, especially when you hire externally, um, pushing them to, to think of things that are outside the box. I mean, being strategic with what resources you give them and what, which resources you make them create on their own. I, I tell every one of my new hires that within your first six months going live, I wanna see something I haven't seen before when it comes to um, demo strategy or, or delivering a demo or, or some sort of even a, a, a structure of an opportunity and how we go about uncovering some of that discovery and, and those sorts of things. Um, to, I know you're probably looking for a more specific answer. Um, I, I've seen a couple of SEs here at Salesforce experiment with OBS, which is sort of that, um, I think it's something broadcasting system. If, if oh, you yeah. see like Twitch streamers and their faces always sort of in the corner and that kind of thing. I've seen a few SEs pop up where like during the demo, their face is on there and some really creative stuff you can do with your screen. So uh, if I was a betting man, I'd probably put, put some money on that being the next like wow factor demo thing I see in terms of pushing the envelope. Yeah, I thought the costume was a good answer uh, right there. So thank you for that. Melissa, how about yourself? 
Oh gosh. Well, you got me distracted on the costume piece. It reminds me to my training uh, when I was at Oracle. We did um, our, it was a nine week wave training coming into the SC program. And we talked about how to differentiate and showing up like we, my demo, my team built a demo around the theme of the board game life. And so that like resonates. I probably, I actually still have a picture of that. And I think Ashley Bunting, you're on the call. You remember that demo. Um, I love the personalized element. And I think for us, you know, like I mentioned, empathy is really one of our, our core values. And so how do you show up in that human element? And so things that have been successful for us as a team is doing some of that research as from the human perspective, right? And so we're a customer feedback management company. Um, we went shopping and you know purchased one of the retailers I demoed to, we purchased product from them and we all had it delivered or went in store and had different experiences. So we could really speak to what that experience felt like. Um, we also wore branded clothing for them um, you know, to really step into that team environment. And so, uh, somehow layering that human element, embracing that empathy uh, for the, the humans in the room and, and the brand. Um, I think that's been really powerful lately. Awesome. Thank you for that. Stephanie, how about you? I know you mentioned you have particular teams that really enhance the experience. Yeah, I love this question. And I am probably going to provide a bit of a controversial response. Um, I know that SCs, when I got first, you know, into this line of work, um, tell, show, tell over and over. That was what was kind of hammered into my brain. And, you know, following the demo to win methodology of having the slide up to do the tell apart, and then you go into the solution, and then you show and then you wrap it up with another slide. I don't really use slides anymore. I find that it's a lot more effective just to jump right into the demo. Um, I still do the tell piece, but I do it verbally and just ground the demo in the value. What are we going to be looking at? What is the value that we're driving for you? And go right into the demo with that. And I find that it's a lot more efficient because they, a lot of times audiences don't really want to sit through your slides anyway. Um, no offense to anybody that's still using slides, but I find that most of the time they're just kind of like wrap it up, let's get to the demo anyway. So that's my first thought. And then the other one was, um, I feel like a lot of um, SCs, they kind of take pride in controlling where they're going with the story and with the plan that they have and the script that they've prepared. But I find that it's really valuable as well to sometimes just let you let yourself be pulled by the, the audience and the prospect. Let them guide you as to what they really want to see. I know that that's sometimes seen as like a form of weakness or just not being prepared, letting them kind of take control. But I find that really valuable. I don't think it's a form of weakness at all. I mean, I think it's like being flexible, right? Sometimes you might feel that the prospect wants you to guide them and, and you know, and you can pick up on that. And then sometimes it's, uh, it, you know, they, they want to run it. And so it's that rigidity, I think, is that a word? Rigidity, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, that rigidity that creates a little tension, right? Like, I think we've all been there where we're like, you know, I'm, I don't need the 45 minute demo. I, I don't need you to go through this. I just need this answer, you know? So I think that that's what pops up in my mind uh, when you mentioned that. Well, we have about 11 minutes left and we want to make sure that we don't uh, go over and respect everyone's schedule. So, you know, we'll, I think that we'll spend, you know, maybe one or two sort of, uh, uh, minutes kind of you know, touching upon some last sort of best practices that anyone wants to share. And then we'll dig into a couple questions. It doesn't look like we'll get to all the questions because we got about 21 uh, that were submitted, but, uh, but we will definitely address those, like I mentioned, through blog posts or conversations in the pre-sales collective Slack. So who wants to you know kick us off, Frank, any, any sort of like last, uh, I, and I just volunteered you, Frank, I apologize. Uh, uh, you know, any last demo best or worst practices that you'd want to, you know, point out to folks to maybe either do or avoid? And Frank, you're on uh, mute, by the way. I am. I am. So I think what we've been saying is, you know, know your customer and the requirements. Uh, one thing we may be didn't touch upon is know who you're selling to. So if you, you know, if 
most of the audience is like C level and business people. You know, you want to be talking business value during the demo. If it's you know technologists and you know those types of people, maybe it's more on the technical side, technical value, or you know a, a combination thereof. Um, one of the questions you didn't ask is uh, uh, you know maybe um, I think it had to do with uh, um, not uh, what wh what is the one memorable demo. So if I can, uh, my first demo, um, after I did the demo, someone walked out up to me and said, uh, you know what, it was a pretty good demo, but you focused too much on the what and the how and not on the why. And that kind of ties back to what I just said. Why is this function important? Not clicking through 18 buttons, but why does it have technical and business value to that CEO or that CIO or that engineer? Awesome. Thank you, Frank, for that. M Melissa, quick question. How do you sort of differentiate the demo that you would do to an existing client versus a new client? Yeah. So you're speaking to my, my blended background here. And so uh, I really love this per perspective and approach because having been on both sides now, right? The pre-sale side, you can really get lost in painting the art of the possible. And it's a lot of fun. There's a lot of strategy involved there. But then when you are thinking of like the actual success side and how our customers are using our, our tool or our, um, our platform, there's little nuances and differences that don't come to light always. And so I think when I'm demoing to an existing customer, uh, this is where you lean on your coach and your champion, right? You have that relationship. Really, naturally, this is the easier sell or should be because you're already a partner, right? They've, we've established a relationship. We have success we're tracking to together. This is where you get to have fun and dig into where are we going next? How are we growing? How are we evolving? I love leaning into the strategy of getting them to think about changing their process maybe a little bit or it, uplifting or uh, elevating is what I wanted to say, um, how they might be thinking about their approach um, versus a net new client. You have to go in and really think about this is the first time they're meeting in moment or your company. And, you know, how do we articulate what we do well, but also how do we build that trust and relationship fast? And so there's a lot of work that has to happen on a net new account uh, to establish yourself and then get into the, the why, the so what, like Frank, you were saying. Um, both of them, either approach though, is really, it comes down to preparation. And so it's either learning about that new customer and, you know, we do a rule of three. We have at least preps, uh, three preps as a team, um, going into any demo, regardless new customer or existing, uh, but making sure you're really invested in understanding everything about that customer that you can and, and tying to how we align, um, but I can, I can go on for hours on that, <laughs> that piece. So if anyone has questions on that, hit me up. Let's chat. Awesome. Leon, you run an organization within Salesforce that you know has certainly uh, a lot of different stakeholders you need to collaborate with. What are some best practices real quick that you know, sort of come to you around improving that collaboration, especially for mid-market enterprise where there are def you know, definitely several groups that you have to interface with? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I think maintaining relationships outside of a particular deal are important. So as much as we don't need extra meetings, if you have particular stakeholders, developing a relationship outside of a specific deal cycle can help, you know, create a, a bond that that cuts down on, on maybe misinterpretations or not really knowing each other super well. So depending on how key that stakeholder is internally, I always suggest that people develop relationships with particular specialists that they're going to work with a lot. Um, maybe outside of, of just in a deal cycle, because those can be rife with different differing POVs and, and some strife there. Um, I've also been receiving a lot of questions about QBranch. So rather than answer them all here, uh, Todd Jansen runs QBranch. So shameless plug, he was on Demo Fest and has been on a couple of PSC contents. Um, if you have more questions, check him out. Um, he's an amazing guy and a really, really insightful person. Awesome. Frank, I, there's a question I was interested in getting your take on, and it's, what's the nicest way to say that we need someone that matters on the wrap-up call because your evaluation contact slash tech champion isn't signing the check, right? That's a, that's a funny one there. 
let the rep handle that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, you put me on the spot. I can't think of a, a, a good answer off the top of my head. No worries. No worries. A, I, anyone? I, think, I really, honestly, I think the rep should probably be the person to yeah. say that. One thing we coach our reps to do is utilize your SEs as one of those bargaining chips. So if you find your AEs bringing you on a lot of calls super early, uh, enable them and, and educate them to say like, hey, I'll bring on my engineer if you bring on XYZ, the same way that you know delivering pricing or something like that can be used as a negotiation chip. That can be a nice way to not only make sure we're having the right conversations, but you're getting to power more easily as well. Awesome, awesome yeah, folks. Yeah. Well, yeah, Sandler, Sandler has, I'm sorry to answer the question. Sandler has a, um, a technique called upfront contract. So you establish like the rules of engagement. And one of them should be that the sales rep says, hey, at the wrap up, we expect the engineer who did the, the evaluation and the, the buyers to be on the phone when we discuss what we accomplished, the value we provided, the, um, the alignment to your requirements, et cetera. Awesome. Thank you for that, uh, Frank. Quick uh, reminder, we have a poll that should surface on your screen right now. We have about four minutes left. And so we'll, we'll go to the end of, or uh, top of the hour, the end of this, uh, this session, but just uh, as a heads up. And uh, again, go ahead and sign up to the Pre-Sales Collective if you're interested in continuing the conversation. It's a great place for that. I'm sure everyone's familiar. I, I did have a, a question around uh, that I see here around demo, a, a live demo or a stage demo, which would you consider a best practice? Can we respond with an it depends? Sure. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. My thoughts exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We're doing a lot of experimenting with, with some really cool tools, which you may be familiar with as well, George, um, in terms of how to provide some of that solutioning early in, in opportunities or for smaller opportunities where maybe you can bring on the whole team. So uh, those types of situations, um, things like consensus and tools like that um, are, are definitely something we keep top of mind because it does depend. <laughs> Yeah. One thing that I've seen, so I actually went through a, I think it was a consensus demo on Salesforce's uh, website. And uh, one thing that I've observed is that at the very top of the funnel, maybe, you know, you can, you know, it's easier to get away with a staged or, you know, product tour or, or demo as you go further down the funnel, then you're going to want more personalized experiences is sort of what comes to mind and what I've observed as well. So uh, folks, we got about two minutes left. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much for, to uh, everyone, all the audience members who have uh, come here today to learn from the, the greatest and the best in the category. Hopefully this was super valuable. We do have the URLs to all the panelists here today in the live chat. And um, so take a look at that. And I'm sure there'll be some follow-ups. We'll of course take the conversation over to the pre-sales collective here in a little bit, just a couple like uh, housekeeping things. And just again, shout out to James and Yuji. I have uh, guy crushes on both of them because they're fantastic. So I just got to say that uh, James, little, little elbow. Um, so yeah, Pre-Sales Collective is crushing it. Uh, five, almost 6,000 counting members. And I hear it all the time. So definitely check it out there. And uh, I think they're going to be, you know, maybe some information either posted in the Slack channel about upcoming uh, webinars or events. And if not, definitely reach out and we'll, we'll send uh, you some information. And uh, folks, thank you again for taking the time to chat today. Again, if you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us or to uh, the pre-sales collective folks directly and uh, have a wonderful day. Take care, everyone.